Hey guys, welcome back. We're doing another Simpsons psychoanalysis this week. This one is on War of the Simpsons. Uh, episode 20, I believe, of season 2. Probably 1991. Which you would think is 22 years ago, but I think it's actually 32 years ago. <laughs> believe it or not. So why are we doing this? Why are we analyzing Simpsons episodes? Is it because I have nothing better to do and my brain is void of any kind of reference besides... Simpsons references. No, of course not. It's because I think especially these early episodes of The Simpsons, there is a natural humor to them. And the thing about humor is there's always, it's not entirely what humor is, but there's a, in good humor, there's a key element there of psychological insight. So let's look at the jokes in this episode and try to learn whatever we can from them because it's way better than reading books. So it starts off with the theme. What it t already tells you where this episode is going, Bart at the chalkboard. I will not do anything bad ever again. I don't know because, you know, they've used the same, uh, they, they, they use the, the same intros, variation intros for different episodes. So maybe I'm, I'm st uh, stretching with this, I, I'm, but I think you're going to find that, oh no, that the, the entire theme is exactly in the chalkboard. I'll never do anything bad again. There's not going to be a resolution to this episode. There's actually no emotional resolution. Now, I get it. It's a TV show. It's not supposed to have any... It's not supposed to change, right? Number one law of television is you always end up exactly where you started from. But at least in Simpsons episodes, there's an emotional change. There's some kind of healthy conflict resolution. I think what you're going to find in this one is there's not... Um, and also what's going on here is, how do I say this? Okay, so this episode is about the reconciliation of the mind and body. Marge, perhaps, representing the mind, home of the body. But it's through the portrayal of this marriage dispute. But it's not just a marriage dispute. Uh, the marriage dispute is also a mask for class conflict. Homer, or excuse me, Marge, uh, Rev. Rev Lovejoy the idea of going on a th on a marriage retreat at some cabin like this is there's a certain class a certain status associated with that but homer is not from that he represents a lower status and here we already start off with it homer pronounces hors d'oeuvres horse duvers very telling that it's in we don't even call attention to what's going on, but Marge lined out, out all these finger sandwiches to say, enjoy our party snacks. Marge is, is conscious, right? She is conscious. She is keeping order to such a, a, an extent that we question, is this really conscious or is this anxiety? And I think through the portrayal of the events in this episode, they will answer that question. I mean, they're obviously not going to come out and say it, but they will clearly answer that question. Is Marge conscience or is she anxiety? So here we also have the theme laid out. Marge is her particular way. Homer is his particular way. And there's really no resolution because they just argue and Marge says, look, I want to have a dinner party because I care about my friends and I want them to have a more integrated part in my life. No, that's not what she says. She says, I want to have a dinner party because they've all our friends have have had dinner parties and I want to pay them back. Which is like such a sad, sounds like anxiety driven um, motivation to, to be part of the you know, social milieu. She doesn't want to connect with her friend. She wants, oh, yeah, uh, Reverend Lovejoy is going to come over, uh, you know, Dr. Hibbert, and he's always great at parties, and I really just love spending time with their friends and getting to know more about them. It's, no, we need to pay them back. She is coming from a place of lack. She is looking for validation from this party, which indicates, you know, how much time she must be preparing, uh, as indicated by, uh, you know, writing out a little phrase in the party, in the finger snack tour. Uh, plate, not drawer. Okay. So the kids, this is going to be an indication of the generational conflict to come. The kids are not allowed to be part of the adults, the, the adult party. And Lisa protests, Mom, I want to hear the witty banter of sophisticated adults. And even Bart is kind of upset for noble reasons. Like, he, he wants to have fun, you know? 
he wants to be an adult. You know, children want to be an adult, uh, adults. And when parents, as indicated here, parents don't integrate them into their lives. They keep childhood as separate. That is a communication divide, you know, a, a gap, a lacuna in communication of the generations. Because any generational trauma is ultimately a communication issue. That's what this comes back to. And here, what Marge and Homer are saying is, no, you you cannot be part of adulthood. We're not going to work to integrate you into our lives. And this is going to, you know, there, there's a B story here, but it's really not a B story because the, the theme of it uh, blends very well with the A story. So Flanders comes over, he says, I have a PhD in mixology and because he's going to make the drinks <laughs> and, and Mo. And I think it's very telling that Homer's there, right? This is, they are the lower class and Mo disdainfully says there calls Flanders college boy, <laughs> not getting that. Obviously PhD in mixology is a, a stupid joke. Um, college boy, right? Where you're, from the lower class or you're from the higher class. We're from the lower class. Yeah. You know, in every uh, Elvis Presley movie, Elvis calls the jocks college boy. Oh, college boy. Eh? You know, like one of those things. Cause you know, <laughs> Elvis, he's, he's part of the lower class. He's just the good looking waiter who happens to be, you know, the best entertainer in the world. But okay. So more indication of the class distinction. And here we go. Marge says, okay, so Flanders is making home with these Flanders, uh, this Flanders Panthers, Planters punch. Marge see this, sees this and says, go easy on the alcohol. Unable to speak to the issue, does so in a tepid way. Classic Marge. Classic Marge. And, you know, unable to speak to the issue, and she even cutes it up a little bit. Right? So this party is self-sabotage for Marge. That's what's going on here, right? She knows that Homer has an alcohol issue. She says, what about the Winfields last year that Homer doesn't remember? Because obviously he, he blacked out. It's self-sabotage from shame um, that she has around expressing her needs and expectations in a relationship. Now, they don't get into it too much in Marge's backstory here, but we find out later that, you know, she comes from a, oh, no, but I, I guess in season one, um, moaning Lisa, it, it was indicated that Marge had to put on a happy face. Marge had to repress emotions, repress part of herself so other people will like her. Now she's not repressing herself so much. That now she's doing that to Homer. And Homer's going to act out here. And, and I just want to say an indication of that unhealthy repression is you, know, you can't even speak to the issue. Right, she clearly didn't bring this up before. Right, so that's that's a good little tidbit there. I think this is a great scene between uh, Barney and Marge's sisters. That's Patty and Selma, and the left and right. I think you guys know that, right? I mean, these are just two characters. I mean, I'll, I'll just put Patty and Selma into one character. These these are two characters that are built to repel others. I mean, Barney and his alcoholism, he, he doesn't put himself together well. This, in some ways, is, is a is a way to keep out other people. I mean, that's what you could view alcoholism as, you know, same thing with, you know, gaining lots of weight. It's a way to just keep people, keep people at arm's length, at, uh, you know, belly's length. But same thing with the sisters, like the, like the smoking, the codependent relationship. They are built to keep people out. So when they meet, they repel each other. They literally repel each other. It's like <laughs> this almost is portrayed as a Patty using a bug repellent on on Barney. Anywho, what's next? Oh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Homer's kind of drunk here, but that's not the point. The point is that he uses this novelty ice cube prank on Dr. Hibbert who doesn't think it's funny because of the toxic chemicals in the novelty ice cube. Homer thinks it's funny because he's from the lower class. He doesn't care about chemicals. He doesn't care about, uh, you know, no like BPA in plastic or what, what you should and shouldn't put in the microwave. You know, that is all 
I think it is genuinely people wanting to take better care of their health, but it's also a, a class thing. Like you're saying, I'm into this specific kind of shampoo. That's, you know, I care about myself. I, I am kind of above you. And I think it's interesting because, uh, this, this conflict here between Hibbert and Homer, this played out with COVID, right? I mean, the, uh, the homers of the world, the homers of America, at least were right for the wrong reasons. I mean, they're right in that this is a party. It's supposed to be fun. And yeah, maybe there's some toxic chemicals, but whatever. Well, the Hibberts were wrong for the right reasons at first, you know, cause, but eventually for the wrong reasons, maybe that's too much of an issue in there, but, uh, the homers of the world, you know, basically said, yeah, I mean, COVID's an issue, but whatever, it doesn't matter. The Hibberts said, no, it really does matter. Look at this research. And in the beginning, it did look really bad. But then it seemed to be more about control than anything else. Sorry if I'm, you know, stepping out of line here. So eventually they were wrong for the wrong reasons. But, okay. So Bart is acting out because he can't be an integrated adulthood. Bart is acting out. This is an indication of the, you know, the B story between the Simpsons children and Grandpa... Uh, Marge has covered up Maggie in, in layers of clothes. I guess this really isn't a great picture. Um, but but Maggie is on their bed under layers of coats. It's like, what are you doing, Marge? You're downstairs having, and you're one year old. You can't leave one one year old on your bed alone and under layers of coats. And and you know what do coats represent? I mean, coats are pretension. They're trying to cover up. I mean, I I, I had this uh. <laughs> documentary idea not that i was ever going to do it but this documentary on open mic open micers like people in new york going to open mics and i was going to call it coats because what you do <laughs> when you're an open micer is you want to you know you want to get up on stage and practice your comedy of course but also you want to hide so you wear your coat up on stage and really i mean you know my view on coats is there a pretension anyway like okay you're just going to go to the simpsons for a dinner party do you need to bring your coat you're going to be outside for a total of 15 seconds i mean it's like, do you go out, do you put your coat on to get the mail in the morning? I, I don't know. You don't really need coats in most situations. If you're going to spend a lot of time outside, okay, that's my issue coming up there. So first of all, Maggie's covered up in layers of coats. Marge covers her up in these layers of a coat. You know, again, representing keeping the lower, the children, the inferior out of the way. Because this party is about fitting in. It's not about connection. It's about fitting in. Uh, and here we foreshadow what uh, what Homer's going to do. Right? Maggie has the value in her hand. And you say, ooh, that's kind of bad. But not only does she have the value, but she just reps it. She can't really see it for what it is. And that may be um, what Homer does here. You have, you have this value. Right? You, uh, the, these neighbors, these friends. And clearly you don't understand the reason why they're you know why it is a value is indicated by marge thinking oh we, we just gotta you know help our friends out um, so you're gonna root it because you don't understand what it is and that's exactly what homer does he has this resentment this anger this aggression and it comes out in this guy he doesn't even know it's this resentment about work so homer has a lot of repressed emotions here now, I'm not saying it's Marge's fault, but clearly we see how this is becoming a compensation for Marge's anxiety. It's nobody's fault. It's just what is happening. Of course, it's Marge's responsibility. Of course, it's Homer's responsibility. But of course, it's Marge's responsibility. Of course, it's, you know, I could just go back and forth. Um, so yeah, there, there's some issue there, there coming up. And then... Uh, Homer's sexuality even comes up, which indicates that, well, why are you ogling this, you know, Maud's boobs? We could take this as an indication of, uh, you know, maybe Homer's sexual needs in the marriage aren't getting met. Not that, of course, it's beholden to Marge to meet every one of Homer's sexual needs, but clearly there's a lack of communication. Marge feels a lot of anxiety. She feels disconnected. You know, she's, she's running around in a frenzy trying to get this dinner party to, together. Please validate me and my family. But clearly there's deeper, you know, sexuality connections here um, that need to be worked out. 
So Homer gets drunk and look at her boobs. Everybody leaves. Homer passes out on the floor. And Marge says, I can't believe I've never been so embarrassed. Um... And Homer's response is, well, what'd you do? And at first the answer is kind of disgusting. Disgusting is a strong word, but we don't want to consider that because, oh, I can't believe Homer says that. (laughs) That's that's so, like, he he messed everything up, and now he doesn't even know that he did anything wrong, and now he's kind of blaming Marge or implicating Marge. Um, But that's, you know, I, I think what this joke is about because ultimately yeah marge what did you do you know you invited all these people over for these wrong reasons in this household where there's poor connection poor communication of course it was going to erupt you you weren't really dealing with the issue for what it is now obviously homer can do the work he needs to do to to manage his own issues but but maybe let's think of this as as an interplay in, in the mind of a individual psyche. So next morning, Homer is still on his back. You know, another indication of his, you know, passive nature. And here he casts a shadow of filth. Another indication that Homer represents Marge's shadow. And here we have, you know, more indication of, of Marge's anxiety, her being passive aggressive, waking Homer up. She's already cleaning, waking Homer up by hitting him with the vacuum. Um, yeah. So Marge wants to fight. She wants to do it outside. I want to make sure the kids don't hear. When I was young, I always hated knowing my parents were fighting. So Marge doesn't want to deal with the issue directly. She wants to hide it she wants to cover it up um and of course it doesn't work it's a compensation compensations are always inferior and and the kids get it lisa says oh they're fighting in the car again that music always sends a chill down my spine and so by marge trying to cover up the fact that there is an argument or there is a split there's a communication issue right she's covering up the communication issue with another communication issue she's not only perpetuating the issue but she's making it worse because now you take this happy song they're listening to the Mexican hat dance. That's a happy song, and now that is associated with these bad memories. Of course, that's going to make it worse. Homer imagines himself as high, you know, not only charming, and all oh, everybody's looking at him. Oh, Homer, you know, your jokes are so witty, but he, it's a, a New Yorker cartoon. It's a New Yorker illustration. <laughs> that's that's how he imagines it. So it's not just his good behavior. It's him in high status, again, indicating that this is part of what is being expressed here. So Homer needs to stay home and explain to Bart why he scarred him for life. And Homer can't speak directly to the issue. He uses euphemisms. He says, I know, I, I admit it, I, I don't, didn't know when to stop. He says, I just hope you didn't lose any respect for me. And the euphemisms don't work on Bart. He knows exactly what happened. But Bart's, Bart's banter does work on Homer because he says, don't worry, Dad, I've... I've don't have any less respect for you than I did, you know, the previous day or anything. I, I'll respect you as much as I always have. And that doesn't work on Homer. Or, no, that does work on Homer. Homer thinks like, oh, thanks. You, you know, you get the joke, right? I don't need to go into it. But this is just more generational lack of communication. And it's, and I, you know, I maybe wouldn't call attention to it, but again, it, it just foreshadows this generational manipulation to come. So Homer tries to go to church, you know, March says, I'm going to church alone, but Homer tries to go to church, you know, trying to curry favor with her. And he walks in and this is just a great gag. I think, you know, a chock full of layers, but Homer has squeaky shoes. He's interrupting church with his squeaky shoes. And again, and it, this indicates what they're they're cheap they're poorly made i mean that's why shoes get squeaky is because moisture gets trapped in the soul so it's a problem with the soul you know s-o-l-e s-o-u-l homer has a squeaky lower class soul and it's interrupting church this thing that at least indicates status in this episode you know, cheap low class i just the point is, is is when there's a joke like this when homer's walking in it 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 just invigorates you because even if you're not thinking of these layers consciously, they're there and they affect you. And when you do stuff like this, 
you don't need, you know, stupid family guy cutaway jokes. Bah humbug <laughs> kids these days. Um, okay, so Marge signs them up for uh, <clears throat> a marriage retreat run by Reverend Lovejoy. It's at Catfish Lake. Homer finds out it's at, at Catfish Lake, and now he wants to go, and he has his fishing hat on there. Marge finds out that Homer wants to fish, and she, what does she do? She just represses more, perpetuates the issue. Homer wants to do this lower class thing, that, but it is therapeutic. It's definitely therapeutic. <clears throat> Marge can't see that. She's just trying to shut it down. That's a low class thing. Oh, clearly you don't care about our marriage. Well, maybe Homer does care about the marriage and he wants to unify it, keep the union together, as we'll see, through the catching of a fish, which, of course, is chock full of, of metaphor and symbolism. Go read Ion. Carl Jung. Hmm. We'll get to it. So Marge asked Grandpa to, to babysit. He's like, oh, last resort, Grandpa. The old Phoebe, the guy who can't be counted on for nothing, know how, dag damn it. I just love how Grandpa talks. Um, <clears throat> so he's resentful because, you know, they just need him. They only call him Grandpa when they need him for something. But <clears throat> he got the resentment on his chest and he's happy to do it. <laughs> very, very psychological, real real thing. Uh, just let me get this off my chest and then I'll be happy with you again and we can go on. In, in indicating just got to express this stuff in relationships. Obviously, Grandpa doesn't do it in the healthiest way, but whatever. <clears throat> and also, yeah, as an occasionally generational thing, I mean, Grandpa just wants to be heard. Uh, so what's... Okay, so driving a catfish link. Homer has a full tank of gas, but he pretends like he doesn't, so they have to stop off and get gas, and there's a bait shop connected with the, the gas station. And this is victimhood, right? You you have a full tank, but you pretend to be empty, and um, you pretend to be empty to manipulate others, you know, to get others to do what you want them to do, of course, <clears throat> all covertly. So he goes into the, into the bait shop to get bait, and he talks to this, the guy who runs the bait shop, who, of course, has that classic Mainer accent, and he tells him about General Sherman. There are these guys at the bait shop who are like Homer. They're part of the low class, but look, they're even more downtrodden. Like, you can just assume that they're divorced, they're single. At least Homer has a wife, and maybe they don't have much employment either. Like, they're they're lost, right? They're they they represent like the blue collar being, you know, it, it, I mean, if we have self-driving trucks, right, that that's what these, these guys, the bait shop rep represent the guys who will lose their jobs temporarily. We don't have to get into it now due to self-driving trucks, all the truck drivers. So he learns about General Sherman and here's the only photo of General Sherman and it's, a specter, right? You just can't really make it out. And of course, that's how the, what the fish symbolizes is these unconscious ideas. If you're looking at a fish in, into the water, you know, into the unconscious, of course, it, it glimmers, it shines, you can see it, but barely see it. And that represents kind of these hypnagogic, these visions that we have. I mean, not just when we're falling asleep, but of course, when we dream, or sometimes you're just sitting there closing your eyes and you have a vision, like these ideas that are just outside of our consciousness, of our conscious, excuse me, they're in our consciousness. And there's just so much meaning packed in them, we can only see them symbolically. We can only see them as, as a fish. As General Sherman. I mean, obviously it's in the name. The, the, the name of the Union General. Gen, General Sherman will keep the Union together. And that's what he's going to do for Homer and Marge's marriage. Not in the way that you would really want. Because like I indicated, this episode has no real emotional resolution. But, but Homer's caught by the idea. I think that's the key. He's caught by the idea. It just hits him. This is what I need to do. He can't really explain it. He just feels that this is necessary. And of course, psychologically, that is very true. The fish really represents Homer's unco... Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm thinking about this. Yeah, it, it really represents his drive for individuation, his drive for integration. And that's really the thing that's going to keep the marriage together. But... Maybe Marge and her anxiety 
and are just not wanting to be weird and fit in can't really see that. I'm not saying Marge is totally at fault here, of course. But Marge is portrayed in one way. That's why I said at the beginning of the episode, Marge is portrayed in one way, but she may not be that way at all. And that's going to bleed into the theme. So anyways, Homer goes to the <clears throat> to the retreat. He asks Reverend Lovejoy, hey, is there going to be time for fishing? And of course, Love, uh, Lovejoy gives his, uh, his answer that's condescending, but also indicates that, you know, the self-help church thing may not be any better than Homer's way of fishing. At least fishing is being honest. <laughs> At least fishing admits like, yeah, we don't, we just do this because it feels good. There's no real science, I guess, like there is for therapy. Um, there's philosophy for it, but not no real, you know, solid science one way or another. Maybe one day. Okay. That's a whole digression. And anyways, Reverend Lovejoy says, Homer, you know, you can't fix a, a marriage in an afternoon. It takes a whole weekend to do that. And then he kind of sends to Homer, he gives him a, a fishing analogy. We must bait our hooks with honesty. That way the happy marriage won't be the one that got away. Kind of sending, using this blue collar expression to relate with with Homer. And I mean, Homer is smart, smart enough to get it. He says, I also um, understand bullying expressions. So here we have Gloria and Steve, and they are at each other's throats. Um, and all, all Reverend Lovejoy gets them to do is look at each other. And it works. I mean, it works short term. They get the, they look at each other, they realize, yes, they are attracted to each other, e even though there's all these resentments in, a re in the relationship. I mean, uh, you can, of course, still be attracted to somebody and have resentments for them. I mean, that's what, in, when people have insecure attachment or avoid, yeah, any kind of a, you know, poor attachment, I think avoid and, and um, anxious are ultimately the same thing. Insecure attachment, that's why I said we'll keep it there. When people have this and they have a resentment in a relationship, they kind of go, oh, well, I guess I just don't love this person anymore. Even though, no, that uh, resentments are natural in a relationship. So it's natural that Steve and Gloria have these resentments, but they don't deal with them. They just remember the good times they've had and they just, you know, kind of cover up the resentments. Again, indication uh, that Lovejoy has no idea what he's doing. He's, his approach to this is from, you know, the mind-body dichotomy, the sunum bonum, like the evil is simply the privation of the good. Let's just shine light on the dark, and that's all we need. We don't need to explicate the, the dark. You know, we don't need to explicate the chaos. We just need the, dem the demiurge from above coming in and placing a stamp on the chaos. So this is going to work. You know, Gloria and Steve, they're going to go and, uh, you know, make love to put it respectfully uh, but they're you know this is not a resolution they're going to be at each other's throats because you have to look at the resentment you have to communicate that in a healthy way otherwise you know all the love you know the chemistry it's not going to matter here's a good shot of uh Reverend love joy his finger is uh has the stag horns i don't think those are devil horns i think those are just this is, you know, he he's he's pointing down to Homer in this accusatory way, like he's higher, Homer's lower, but you can see there the implication is, yeah, he doesn't really, he's not who he he says he is at the very least. He's he's more animal than anything else. He pretends to not be, he, he pretends to be above fishing, but <clears throat> and the kids are manipulating Grandpa, right? They want to be part of adulthood. They want to be integrated. But they can't. So if I well, if I can't be integrated into adulthood, why would I bother being honest with my intentions? I'm never going to be part of you anyway, so I'm just going to manipulate you to get what I want. And that's what Bart shrewdly sees. You know, Lisa has more of a conscience, so she's a little bit more hesitant to it. But she goes along, too, because she was upset that she couldn't be part of the party, of course. Um, they're watching McBain movies. This is a great scene from the Big Bane movie, which I guess there's really just one McBain movie. Um, but this is the part of, the, of you know, McBain here represents Dirty Harry, where the police chief goes, McBain, in this precinct, we go by the book. And then McBain takes out his, you know, his, <laughs> his large gun that he's not supposed to have. And he says, well, buy book, right? Um, which I, I always loved that joke when I was a kid. I always loved the buy book and that pun, but... 
Uh, this is representative of what's going on between Homer and Marge, right? Homer or Marge is the precinct. She has all these rules, regulation, bureaucracy, really rules that just get in the way from things that may need to be expressed. Like you got to be a little bit of a bad guy to, if you want to catch bad guys. It's the theme of Demolition Man, so we know that's 100% true. Um, and uh, Homer has these urges. Homer has these healthy urges that need to be nurtured in a relationship if they're going to have a solid relationship. Same thing. Um, so it's clear that Homer really is not going to be kept down. He needs to find his own way through this marriage conflict. He tries to sneak out again. Marge catches him. And here, Homer is finally honest with Marge. He confesses. You see, he's there, you know, kneeling. <clears throat> Again, you know, Marge on high, looking down on him, giving him those eyes. <clears throat> like a judging, leering at eyes. But Homer admits it. It's like, yeah, I'm just thinking about fishing. That's all I want to do. That's all I really, only reason why I agreed to come here. I don't really care about the whole marriage retreat. So Homer confesses <clears throat> and Marge thinks that she has won. You can tell by her self-satisfied smile there. Homer looks like a wreck, but what actually happens is the opposite. Home, that, that is the exact moment when Homer confessed. He gave whatever his urge is. He just, I guess you could say shine a light on it and did it dissipate or did it give it more power? Indicating, I think the genuine, the authenticity of Homer and he can't explain why he needs to catch General Sherman to keep the Union together. But he does. He just has to. So, <clears throat> now, once you confess, you know, once you, you know, you, you can try to catch a fish in your entire life. You can try to catch that unconscious idea your entire life and integrate it. <clears throat> it's not going to happen. Once you confess, once you're honest, once you're able to connect with people and not, you know, go through life hiding your thoughts and feelings, that unconscious idea, that fish will catch you. And that's exactly what happens here. So Homer goes for a walk. This kid leaves his pole. Homer, t you know, says back to him, hey, kid, you left your pole. And as soon as he picks the pole up, of course, he, General Sherman, catches Homer. Hmm. The conflict at home uh, with the Simpson children and grandpa is getting irritable. Uh, literally, I guess you could say, because they're drinking coffee and shouting at grandpa. And grandpa's shouting back, and I just think it's hilarious that grandpa's in a neighboring here. <laughs> this is so good. Uh, and here we have a more indication that this trained marriage counselor uh, says it's all Homer's fault. Indicates, you know, the surface level aspect of this therapy there's no doubt that it's all fault and not this interplay and it's not about who's at fault that's a lot you know just none of that no depth no insight unlike what homer's doing they're back at the simpson household i just love grandpa singing in the shower just an indication of of this general disconnect grandpa singing in the shower over there by this guy george cohan Anyways, it has the of uh, it's like a, a a World War One fight song, you know. This pro patriot is a fight song for this war that, of course, ended up being a total travesty. But that I mean, Grandpa's so stuck in the past, he's singing. And in fact, in that song over there, I don't know if that's the only time they say "Johnny, get your gun." And of course, the novel was "Johnny got his gun," and it showed all the horrors of war. <laughs> Just how tuned out Grandpa is, you know. Um, and here, you know, uh, part of this is like, wait, does Homer just want to catch this fish so he can be famous? So he can get this, you know, cheap value? But here even Homer admits to himself uh, eventually that, wait a minute, there are no famous fishermen. I'm, I'm not going to be famous. But he still wants to catch General Sherman, so it's clearly not about the, the fame. We're, we're discarding that as an idea here. And here, General Sherman jumps up. Um, and what, oh, oh yeah, so what does Homer say? He says, holy mackerel. Holy mackerel, of course, is uh, a more, you know, benign uh, 
a euphemistic, a non-blasphemous expression of Holy Moses. Moses, of course, being the founder of uh, monotheistic religions, Akhenaten. So that indicates or gives us more of a clue of what this fish really is, is that it represents Homer's uh, union behind an idea. Homer's integration of his life into a one idea, into one idea. That's what General Sherman represents, and that's what's really going to save the marriage. Because now Homer won't have these dark parts coming out when he gets a little bit drunk. They'll be well integrated into his psyche. So that's that's what there is. And then if there's any confusion about you know the the symbolic or the symbolism here, you have you know General Sherman up back against the sun, you know, very in, indicated in monotheistic religions. Homer, or excuse me, Grandpa's getting depanced as a Bart throws a party. Homer's satisfied with General Sherman there. Uh, and we later found out, or so, sorry, so we're back at the Homer, uh, at the Simpson household. Okay, okay. We're, we're wrapping up soon here. And uh, Grandpa's crying because he said, and on the surface, he's saying, oh, I, I just feel like I failed as a grandparent. I, I really try. I feel so bad. And now uh, Bart and Lisa grow conscious and they start cleaning and they get the house all cleaned up. But of course you find out that, hey, you're going to manipulate me. I'm going to manipulate you back. There's no resolution here. Homer throws uh, General Sherman back. You know, there was a, a moment of psychological unity for Homer and Marge couldn't get it because she's the bureaucracy because she is clearly showing her true colors here as anxiety by not being able to see what's going on. Um, but Homer can't argue for himself. So he throws it back. He throws his unity back. He, he, he has this brilliant idea, but he can't explicate it. And because he can't explicate it, because he can't explain it, because he's not intelligent, He's not going to keep it around. You know, the margins of the world who are run by anxiety are going to win. So, that's what happens here. But, the union is kept together at least temporarily because they, they at least, they had it out. They had it out, you know, the unconscious was brought on the table, onto the boat, and they looked at it, which at least relieved some pressure, and they're indicating that General Sherman did keep the union together. It gives you a little wink. They come home, the kids ask, how's your marriage? And Homer says, same as usual, perfecto mundo. It's, of course, the same. they actually didn't resolve anything. They just, you know, symbolically uh, had sex. And then they find out that Grandpa was just manipulating them, and way to go, Grandpa, I'll never trust another old person again. Again, just indicating that, that there's no emotional resolution in this episode. Uh, but is there? Is there some kind of resolution? Because on the closing scene, we see some guy at the St. Bates shop, the guy with the Mainer absent accent telling him about General Sherman. But now, now it um, shows how Homer, how these, you know, even lower parts of, of Homer, these guys who represent even lower parts of Homer than even Homer is, right? I mean, Homer's still married, which I guess you could say is a success. These guys are affected because, yeah, they're still telling the story about General Sherman, but they add a little twist to it. You know, they said one guy came close. His name was Homer, goes by the name of Homer, and they have clearly mythologized him. So I think maybe there was a change. It is an occasion here. There, there was a change in Homer um, that may be the seed for something else little bit of hope there at the end that they're going to resolve this conflict eventually. And uh, that's it. Thank you, guys. I enjoy doing these. If you have any questions for me, animus at animusempire.com or, you know, just want to reach out. Do you think um, these, comp you know, my, my analysis here, do you think this is anywhere in the vicinity of correct? Let me know in the comments. Also, we do free consultations, animusempire.com slash schedule. 
thank you guys and um have you know as much fun <laughs> watching the Simpsons as I have. <laughs>